okay let's continue with the second part of this uh, lecture about the web architecture uh, the we uh, we left uh, and this slide okay when we uh, wanted to uh, move from the web server layer uh, to bound down to the application uh, server layer just remember uh, in the first part uh, we discussed about the web server right now we are going down across the stack uh, of technologies and uh, see what happens at the uh, application uh, le server level so what uh, the application server is the component uh, is the server component that uh, is responsible for dynamic page generation uh, this means that uh, whenever um, a web page uh, is not uh, already available uh, to the web server uh, something must be uh, done uh, to to generate it uh, what I'm saying is that uh, nobody today is writing HTML pages by hand. Uh, the uh, web server is only able to deliver web pages or resources that were already available as uh, files uh, on the file system. Um, but that, that, the, that would imply that everybody should be writing HTML and keeping that updated uh, minute after minute uh, when something happens. Of course, this is not credible. The HTML pages are being generated by software program uh, whenever uh, they are needed and the application server is the layer of the architecture that is responsible <coughs> for this kind of, uh, of dynamic generation so it's some way a middle uh, level between the data that uh, actually corresponds to the information we want to give to the user and the uh, uh, web server that uh, uh, delivers the web pages to the to the um, client um, we also briefly mentioned and we'll come to that uh, later uh, about uh, how the uh, application server is able to to implement a session mechanism overcoming in some way the lack of memory of the http protocol but it's something of uh, an advanced topic that we don't uh, uh, see into detail today so uh, what's happening what's happening here um, from the client point of view, let's imagine we uh, uh, request a URL, request an address, um, uh, and uh, of course the browser will start an HTTP request, and uh, that will reach the web server. The web server uh, has two choices at this point. One, whether the request contains a path that, that, co that is corresponding to a physical file available in the file system, and then the web server is able to reply like we've said before but in many other cases uh, uh, that resource uh, is not already available hmm? so it's an indication it's a command is a request to the web server please give me this resource but this resource is not existing yet so the web server the only thing it can do it can do is to delegate the creation of the resource to a software component so to a software application to the real uh, web applications out there so that's why I, I put some gears here in the web server so it's not just the server but it contains some algorithms uh, that we write uh, that actually generate the content so the web server says uh, i don't know how to deliver this file because this file doesn't exist i delegate to a software to a program to an algorithm this logic here the generation of this file and this logic has the only uh, goal of generating actually the html file this HTML file then is returned to the web server and uh, that can be complete uh, can complete then uh, the request and uh, uh, return the HTML file to the to the client okay so the web server is still uh, receiving a request and delivering an HTML file as before the client doesn't see any difference is making a request and receiving an HTML file the only difference is that this HTML file one millisecond before the uh, the request didn't exist yet it was general it has been generated uh, um, uh, it has been generated uh, on the fly on the request um, and uh, and just for me if i make another request one second later or one millisecond later then uh, usually the web server receives the new request and reactivates again the logic software the algorithm and will regenerate another HTML file, which is then sent back. So every request will generate a new HTML file just for the purpose of sending it back, and then this file is usually discarded immediately. Uh, I, I wrote command and parameters because usually this logic should generate maybe different results every time, 
and so this logic uh, needs to have some inputs uh, in order to generate an output which is uh, uh, compatible uh, with, with the request and so there are mechanisms for we, by which we can send some parameters some information to the uh, application logic and uh, uh, and so that have, having the logic uh, to um, uh, respond to this information for example if this is a web server that can show me the my email messages uh, of course uh, this uh, program uh, this logic this software should sh uh, show me my emails and not uh, the ones of another user of the system and so in a, in a way this software this application should be able to discriminate user one from user two and uh, give the correct information to uh, each of them hmm, without uh, make, making any confusion so that's why this uh, of course is relies on some external information in order to be able uh, to provide uh, the result and so the uh, HTTP request uh, will need to enclose, uh, contain some parameters, uh, and we, we will see when we see HTTP in more detail that this can be embedded as uh, parameters or query parameters into a GET request, uh, or otherwise we could do, use uh, the POST method, which is another uh, possible verb, another possible action that the HTTP protocol uh, supports uh, um, by sending data. Uh, so these are low-level mechanisms that are used to provide uh, to the software application the parameters that, is need, that it needs uh, uh, to customize the, the reply. And uh, uh, of course, uh, we should be able to include or integrate in a way into the web server some programming language. Okay, this uh, software must run somewhere and this somewhere should be strongly connected to, to, the, uh, to the web server. Uh, this is a software. The software can be written, of course, in a programming language. We, in some cases, there are programming languages that were invented specifically for the web. In other cases, there are programming languages that are being reused, so they were already existing for other purposes, but are also being used into uh, the, um, the web application layer. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, um, the, the application uh, level here is able to maintain the state of a session. Uh, we, we mentioned uh, before that uh, HTTP is a forgetful, uh, is a memoryless and forgetful protocol. Every time I make a request, uh, this request is honored, is responded, and then immediately the web server forgets about me. So what happens when I log in into a, a, a website, the login information is sent to the web server, the web server Tells that to the application server, for example, and then they use me the 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 page, the, the page, my my personal page on the website. But immediately after, the web server forgets about me. So if I had to uh, click on a link or re refresh the page, the web server would not remember that it just authenticated me. And this is not the job for the web server. The HTTP protocol does not support that. This would be a job for the application server in order to recognize whether a new request coming out. Uh, is coming from a user which already has an interaction story with me and so if we click on something the application server we, uh, will recognize me and remember that i was the same user that two seconds ago just authenticated onto my website so that's uh, what gives uh, us the uh, illusion of continuity when you are uh, using a web application we know that the web or the application remembers us from page to page from step to step this is not uh, uh, thanks to the HTTP protocol, but it's thanks to some uh, magic, let's say, that happens on the application layer, and it relies on a sh uh, sharing um, a magic number called the cookie between uh, the browser and the application server itself. Hmm? So when uh, we will uh, revisit this topic when we reason about the, um, the sessions on the on the web server uh, programming, just to, to clarify that cookies are part of the HTTP protocol. But the usage of cookies for creating session is instead uh, uh, the task of the application level. Okay, so the, our uh, timeline hasn't changed very much. Uh, the only difference is that uh, when the web server analyzes the request, it won't look for the resource on the file system because it's not there. Uh, rather, it will pass it, uh, delegate to the application server that will start running and generating the HTML. So this is time where the application server uh, is running uh, uh, just for creating the HTML file that we need uh, in our uh, in our uh, web page request. So we don't have just a uh, um, file ex uh, exchange time, but also computing time. The application server time is actually this one. 
in many cases the web server and the application server are physically contained in the same uh, um, com physical computer in, in other cases uh, they may be separated into different uh, uh, machines uh, but for the for us uh, we are reasoning about the logic levels so in our picture what did we change uh, we are adding something here on the right uh, the HTML file is no longer assumed to be pre-existing rather uh, the HTML file is being generated by a software and uh, the software is composed of two blocks one is the application server itself and the other the, the, and the second one is the application the application server is the interpreter for our code hmm? basically it's the environment in which our code runs and the application is our code proper so the code that we write to generate the HTML file for example, if, you are writing, if I'm writing the um, application in, uh, in uh, Python, this application server would be the Python interpreter with the proper libraries. Uh, if I'm writing this in JavaScript, the application server would likely be uh, Node.js with the proper uh, HTTP server libraries. If I'm writing this application in Java, this application server would be a JVM, of course, with the uh, Java Enterprise libraries and so on. So there is always a uh, runtime environment in which the application is running and then there's the application source code or execu executable code which is actually running inside the application server again green standard blue custom so the application server the runtime environment is something standard we install python we install node.js we install jvm uh, java or whatever uh, the application is our specific code the code that we write on the server side uh, you see that uh, in this box uh, i didn't specify language i put some asterisks uh, to say that uh, the language of the application depends okay it's something that uh, we, the web developer will decide uh, on their own uh, depending on uh, on other constraints with their preferences with their skills with the existing uh, software or whatever it's not important of course the application server must match the application hmm? so if i decide to write an application in php of course i will install the php interpreter and integrate the PHP interpreter with the web server so that they can communicate. The web server can delegate to the PHP interpreter the, the interpretation of a page that will then interpret the script and then return the HTML back and so on. Hmm. So the, depending on the kind of language you want to support, I will install a different application server software. I will write the code in that environment and I will link my web server with my application server and of course there are standard ways of uh, configuring uh, and integrating an application server uh, inside the web server they are two separate components uh, but they work very strongly together another thing that we should notice is that in many cases for example the images uh, are static files so there are some resources on web pages that are not uh, programmable are not gen uh, dynamically generated for example the html code most likely will be generated dynamically by the application while the images uh, usually are static are just created by hand and they are re reused so in this case the web server will actually multiplex or divide the requests some requests can be just honored by looking at some files whether when the request is for a static resource other requests are multiplexed and sent to the application server when this request is for a dynamic resource hmm? so there is this difference that uh, uh, makes that the application server will not receive uh, all the requests remember our wikipedia page most likely only the html uh, request was a dynamic one all the other resources were just static files that could be served by the web servers and web server and did not involve uh, the application server itself uh, speaking of application servers uh, there are a couple of statistics that show that many uh, most of the pages uh, today are still written in PHP, which was uh, uh, um, a language that was invented uh, several years ago for um, uh, specifically for developing web pages. Uh, we just remember that uh, Facebook is running PHP, uh, WordPress websites are running on PHP, um, um, Drupal websites are running on PHP, uh, Joomla websites are running on PHP. So there are a lot of content management systems. Uh, that use uh, uh, PHP as a, their programming language and therefore 
uh, we have the popularity of the number of websites that are using this language this doesn't match uh, the number of uh, uh, the traffic or the number of users just the number of, of websites and then there are the microsoft technologies uh, in ash.net and uh, java and uh, other languages below hmm. that are used as uh, application uh, server files uh, you see that JavaScript it, it's quite low on the application on the server side uh, it's not uh, strange because it's not very uh, efficient at this moment uh, we in, the, in this course we will use JavaScript of course on the server side just to avoid learning another language okay but we know that the real uh, programming language on the server side uh, maybe JavaScript is not the only choice is not the first choice uh, we'll try to uh, standardize on JavaScript both on the client on the server side but when you will be working on the server side you'll see that uh, uh, java and php are probably uh, more uh, logical and scalable choices especially if you are doing some complex architecture probably java will be considered more important um, but again uh, if we just pick the the first ones uh, we see that php is over 80 percent of the share and uh, microsoft asnet is another 15 percent or something like that and the, the resulting five percent more or less is java and uh, inside the java world also there are different products uh, that are compatible and more or less interchangeable uh, that can provide the same uh, the same results uh, that can allow you to uh, create web server applications in java and uh, what i wanted to mention is that php 80 percent and more and uh, more than 50 percent of the java world in this case we have tomcat in both cases they are open source products so they are free from any licensing so again 85 plus 5 is uh, near 90 percent of the internet also the application level application server level is running on open source software like we already saw with the uh, with the web server component so a lot of standard components uh, and uh, are used in the web architectures and most of them most of them are also open source products Okay, let's go back down to the third level, to the bottom level of our, our pyramid, which is the database server. The database server, uh, as the name says, uh, uh, stores the data uh, that the uh, application server needs. So the application server can provide you maybe with a, an HTML file with your email messages, but how can the application server know which emails uh, did you receive and which are your contacts and so on? Uh, well, of course, there needs to be a, a data storage somewhere that we store the information that the database server um, needs to uh, deliver um, sorry that the application server needs to know in order to complete the web page so web developers uh, started to think uh, i'm talking about 20 years ago okay we need uh, to uh, structure and access some data uh, in our application to make it uh, easily accessible modifiable and usable for the uh, creating web pages uh, there were some initial attempts uh, at storing data in memory or in custom files or something some bad solution like that but then of course uh, uh, developers looked around and saw that uh, there was some emerging at that time 20 years ago um, relational technology sql databases and so they started to use uh, relational databases uh, as a back-end data storage for their um, for their applications for their uh, web applications um and we'll comment uh, the the good and the bad of these choices uh, but actually the, the role of the database server is to store the data hmm, and uh, allow the application server to uh, update uh, query and uh, uh, create new information into that database hmm. uh, so from the architecture point of view uh, we are adding a new layer on the right of the picture so we had the, the web server, the application server, and now we have a database server there. I draw that separately because most likely there will be separate hardware because they have very different hardware requirements. Uh, the web server <coughs> is, is mostly about uh, um, bandwidth and input-output performance. The database server is also about memory and uh, disk capacity and so on. So they are usually very different kinds of, uh, of, of hardware. But nevertheless, there are different logical levels uh, in which the application logic uh, whenever it needs to access some information on the um, that is stored in the database uh, it will send a query to the database <coughs> wait for the database to execute that query and to provide some data back uh, 
to the uh, software and they, then this data will be used of course to combine HTML uh, the HTML page as before mm -hmm. so the only difference is that the, uh, the application logic can interact with the data storage whenever it needs to store some information or to retrieve some information and of course this communication <coughs> will be done with the language of the database so the SQL language in particular uh, if we are adopting uh, um, relational databases uh, or maybe there are some uh, in some application we are using some uh, uh, non-relational databases they are called sometimes NoSQL databases or document-oriented databases uh, where we don't need uh, all the uh, power and consistency guaranteed by the relational model and just we want something that is maybe a simpler, faster uh, and less structured way of uh, storing some information. Hmm. So we'll of course uh, uh, have a look at a bit also at this level when we create our applications but uh, after that uh, uh, if we adopt the relational model uh, um, usually the, the communication no, between the application level and the database level is in SQL this is just a slide that uh, just shows us that uh, uh, an example of a fragment of a PHP page uh, where we see that uh, in QPA page code, I, uh, I will send a query from the application server. So in PHP, we are inside the application server and we need to send a query to the MySQL server and to analyze the results that come out from this query. And this query is composed inside the application itself. So the application um, software will compose the query and uh, uh, as a string send this query to the database server and then get the results back so this is more or less the, the high level pattern this is not a good example because we are composing the query by concatenating pieces of strings uh, some of them coming from the user we learn better ways of doing that this is just to understand that we are mixing the programming language of the application server php in this case with uh, the programming language of the database in this case sql so we are mixing sql and uh, PHP in the same files and uh, that's why the the, um, the programmer uh, let's see first this diagram and then how it maps to the timeline uh, the programmer at this point needs to uh, write in the application also write some SQL code some queries directly in the application and this SQL code will be sent to the BMS uh, and that of course this the query will run against the database that we have here at the bottom at the bottom um so yeah we have this block called database there uh, again the, the color convention still holds uh, the dbms server is a standard component uh, maybe mysql maybe mydb maybe uh, sqlite uh, maybe oracle maybe another kind of database it's uh, already a software that is ready while the database contents uh, is my design i need to design the schema i need to load the data and so on again blue is custom green is uh, is a, a standard hmm. so this poor application programmer must learn the environment and the language of the application but also must learn sql in order to be able to interact with the server and of course you must know html because html is what has to be generated hmm. um, if we go back to the timing diagram uh, what we see is that the application server once it receives the request it, underst it understands that it needs some data probably and so we start querying the database server and what I draw here uh, is that the, mm, maybe for generating one single web page I need to query database server more than once now let's uh, just imagine our uh, uh, hypothetical messaging application uh, so I need to provide uh, a list of messages so a query for giving me the list of messages I need to say the number of unread messages. So another query for giving me the number of read and read uh, or new messages. I need maybe to have a sideline with the contact. So I need another query to extract the names of the contacts uh, in, my, in my messaging application and so on. So for creating the content of one single page, every portion of the page probably needs to access different parts of the database. And so it needs different queries uh, to be executed against uh, the database server uh, so uh, that's also why the database server is mo um, nearly always the most critical performance critical component uh, of our web architecture because it has more work to do uh, it receives a higher number of queries and it must respond very quickly uh, to those queries 
um, okay so this concludes uh, uh, the, the the levels that we have on the server side mm -hmm. so right now we uh, started from a very simple architecture where we have only the web server and then we started to add components there in order to make this web server more intelligent more complex right now uh, but right now we are still uh, stuck with a browser like we had in uh, i don't know 1998 and or 2000 so 20 years ago we had uh, uh, more, much simpler web browsers because most of the complexity was on the server but having uh, an old browser or a not so intelligent browser um, creates a problem because then uh, the web pages are just that are just pages are just fixed content are just something that has been received and the, uh, the browser is drawing the page on the screen but the page isn't interactive doesn't have any content that have, have, has, have been, uh, doesn't have any responsiveness uh, to my actions so the first uh, generation of the web the web was based on server-side computing uh, only could deliver fixed pages mm? like wikipedia for example once you have the page the only thing you can do is read the page look at it click on a link uh, or maybe uh, fill some form that's it mm? there's no real uh, application interaction right now we are used to application where we do a page where every element in the page is responsive is dynamic does something and react immediately mm? in the uh, classical programming every time you click on a link you're just destroying the page and creating a new one hmm? so this is the model of the web we want to go over this model and we want to make the web pages more dynamic dynamic what does it mean it means that the, the web page must change we must be able to make it change after it is loaded hmm? so after the page has been delivered so the web server connection has, be, has been cut the web server is no longer uh, active uh, in the browser the HTML content can be changed by the user in some way and can adapt to the user actions in some way so we mean something running on the browser basically we means uh, uh, we need uh, uh, that the browser should be able to execute some programs uh, and uh, these programs uh, should be embedded in some way in the web page uh, in a programming language that every browser will be able to understand so as a web developer i should uh, create uh, my code that i will embed uh, in the web page but that will run on the browser side since i don't know which browsers uh, my users will be using uh, the only thing i can do is to uh, to pick a language that i'm sure that every browser will understand javascript that's the only choice okay and so uh, but let's uh, revisit, revisit what we said a programmer on the server side writes a problem program embeds this program in a web page and whenever every user in the world would visit that web page well that program will be executed accepted and executed by the browser so i just described the, the perfect virus a code that somebody writes and just by visiting one web page you are executing the code that ga that guys just wrote so it could be malicious code or whatever so in order for javascript not to be the virus in the world uh, or the malware uh, the execution of javascript inside the browsers is very very constrained so all the code will run uh, in a very restricted uh, execution environment in a sandbox uh, so that uh, um the uh, javascript code will not have access of, uh, to any resources on your machine except the content of that specific web page of course there are flaws in sometimes in these uh, restrictions uh, and so it's very difficult to uh, very hard to balance uh, what javascript can do what the operating system will allow it to do uh, what the programmers would want to do and what the implementations uh, uh, sometimes fail in uh, to enforce some security measures but this is the model the model uh, 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 describes uh, a newer layer so right down now we we added uh, one layer to the left uh, so inside the client we don't touch the server side on the right anymore we are working on the left hand side so the client uh, a browser is now enriched by an execution engine so there's an engine here that we have, is able to execute uh, javascript programs 
and these programs are here i put two lamps because there may be many parts of the page that are running different programs different uh, algorithms and uh, um, so once uh, i load the web page with the mechanism that you already know this web page will contain some javascript code and this javascript code will be sent to the runtime part of the of the browser and will start executing and the only thing that we this uh, uh, javascript can do is to interact uh, with the page uh, which is displayed on the browser so the only universe that is accessible to this javascript is only the page the currently displayed page and there should be of course an interface uh, between uh, these two uh, components uh, uh, possibly a standard one because uh, remember this code is code written by the programmer and this block here is instead the, uh, the browser itself written by Google or written by Mozilla Foundation written by Microsoft written by Apple or whatever uh, and so we the JavaScript should be able to access in a standard way hmm, the content of the page uh, through a specific API, specific library, which is called uh, DOM. Uh, DOM stands for Document Object Model, means, meaning it's a model, so as the data structure. Object model, a data structure in the, uh, in the object-oriented sense, so that we define objects and inheritance and relationship between objects, that represents the document. Uh, document is the, is the um, technical term for representing the web page. Uh, the definition here is the DOM, the W3C do Document Object Model, is a platform and language neutral interface. It's not an implementation. It's just the definition of an interface, of an API uh, specification. And this interface allows programs and scripts uh, to dynamically access and update. So I can read and I can modify, access and update, what? The content of a document the structure of a document and the style of a document i can modify the content or read the content so i can modify the text the images the style so something it can can be moved can be made to appear or to disappear or to you know, or to shift to change the style change the color and so on everything every modification to the document can be done by accessing this interface of course, this is an interface and the browser needs to, Im to implement, to give an implementation to this interface. But the JavaScript programmer can program against this interface. I know what are the objects, I know what are the, the methods, I know what is the effect of these uh, methods when I call them on these objects. And this is standardized by the DOM and every browser provider will, of course, uh, um, have their own implementation. And the structure of the DOM is basically a tree that starts with the document node and then has different nodes for all the HTML elements where the nesting of the elements that is uh, declared in the HTML file here is more visible because it becomes uh, implemented as relationship between these nodes. So the DOM is a tree of nodes that is, all, is rooted onto a document node and then uh, describe the real content of all the, the, the page. Uh, we have elements, we have attributes, and the nice part is that the JavaScript programs can read all of this, so can understand exactly what is going on on the web page, and can modify the DOM. So can modify any of these elements, can add new elements, delete, uh, change the properties, modify the attributes, and so on. So the JavaScript programs have full access over the modification or the evolution of this DOM, and uh, whenever you touch the DOM, whenever you modify this model, the web page is immediately updated by the browser. So the browser will update immediately the visual appearance of the page according to the kind of modification you can do to the DOM elements. So uh, at this point, we have uh, added two ingredients, two technical ingredients. One is uh, we decided to use the JavaScript language that must be interpreted inside every browser and uh, uh, possibly in a standard way and uh, a standard interface, uh, the DOM API, uh, that will allow the JavaScript programs to access the resources of the browsers and in particular the resources of the web page. Hmm. Uh, also CSS, the style sheets uh, come into play, we'll say we dedicate a section to those uh, uh, because they are also you, they are used very strictly in conjunction with the DOM, so DOM and CSS can, could, cannot really be separated as technologies. In our picture, 
what do we have now well uh, inside the browser the main modification is that inside the browser now we have this javascript engine so it's the interpreter for the javascript language uh, different uh, uh, um, browser uh, developers uh, of course they implemented their own javascript engine and the javascript engine is able to execute the javascript code and also access through the dom interface uh, all the layout information that the browser already has uh, from the HTML for the interpretation of the HTML code. Uh, where is, does this JavaScript come from? Well, of course, it comes from the server. JavaScript code will be delivered by the web server to the browser, and the browser will start executing that. Again, JavaScript is something is, is a blue box, so it's something written by the developer. And the JavaScript engine is a green box, so it's a, it's a standard component inside the browser. Uh, the JavaScript is written by a developer on the server side, but is executed by the browser on the client side. So I'm executing this code somewhere else, it's not in my machine, and don't have the control over the environment, the full control over the environment where this runs. The application code, server side applications, runs before the response just to create the response the javascript will run after the response is received and after the web page has been uh, read and the, the dom has been constructed uh, so the fact that this javascript is on the right side is just because we need to store it somewhere so that the browser can download it but uh, as you see from the server side point of view it's just a static resource like an image so the web server or the application server don't understand this JavaScript don't look at this JavaScript they just transfer it as a file and then this file is, is executed on the browser after the page has been received and after the connection with the server has already been uh, completed and closed so this is a big addition to our to our uh, architecture because it changes completely the nature of the browser the, the browser is not just just a machine for layout but it becomes a runtime environment uh, for any software hmm? in a standard way, which is uh, something very ambitious to do. Um, I mentioned before uh, the styling, the, the fact that uh, JavaScript can also modify the style, style of the pages, uh, um, adapt them to different resolutions, to the user actions, and so on. Um, and so we should have a, a, an easy way of changing the properties, the graphical properties, the appearance, uh, of the different uh, uh, HTML elements. And the style sheets, uh, the CSS style sheets, uh, is the technology that is giving us a very powerful, even if sometimes complex, uh, mechanism for uh, changing all the visual, in some cases also the behavioral properties of the elements in the screen. Uh, CSS stands for cascading style sheets. So, style because we are governing the style of the web page the visual appearance uh, sheets because it's a sheet with the many rules uh, and cascading because these rules will apply uh, and uh, there are many layers of these rules and they will be applied in a cascade so there are some rules that are applied first uh, and then some other rules that are applied on top of the first ones and the other ones that are still applied to the results of those and so on so there is a complex cascade that <coughs> decides <coughs> finally which rules uh, really apply to which element so they compute the style of every element css uh, uh, rules uh, are quite easy to 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 formulate uh, and they become complex just when they come when there are many rules combined together uh, the idea is that a rule is compo composed of two parts a selector and a declaration or a set of declarations a selector is uh, an expression in a specific language that uh, um, matches one or more nodes in the DOM tree. So for example, H1 is a selector that matches all the DOM elements of type uh, H1. So I don't know if my example here, there, were, there was an element H1 here. So the selector H1 will match this element and only this one. And, uh, and for all the elements, uh, there may be more than one, all the nodes uh, matched by the selector, we, uh, the declarations can attribute some values to some properties. These properties are the properties of the DOM nodes. 
we say DOM is an object-oriented mo uh, model, so every node uh, is a class that has some properties. Uh, every uh, DOM uh, node has uh, more than 100 properties that control the color, the size, the alignment, uh, uh, the margins, uh, the border radius, and, uh, and how they react to mouse events and so on. There are really many, many properties defined on every node, and we can give a value to each of these properties. So in this case, we are saying that all the titles, first level titles, will be blue and will have a size, a font size of 12, properties, uh, of 12 pixels. And this rules, rule is combined with all the other rules that are defined in the style sheets. Uh, and at the end, we are uh, customizing the appearance, the style uh, of every element in the, in the DOM. So from the architectural point of view, uh, CSS uh, style sheets are just one text resource that we define on the server and gets interpreted by the layout engine there. So we write it here. Again, the web developer must know the language, SQL, HTML, JavaScript, and also CSS in order to be able to create one web page. And the CSS is not interpreted on the server side. It's, ignored, it's, it's content is not uh, read, it's not understood, while it's being sent to the browser and it's being interpreted by the layout engine. So in this case, we are changing the nature of the layout engine. First, the layout engine was a fixed algorithm. Give me an HTML and I provide a page. Right now, the layout engine is programmable in some way because according to the CSS rules, it will create a different layouts, layouts for the same input HTML. So the HTML has a say default interpretation, a default layout that will be applied if there are no style sheets. But if we have style sheets, then the layout and the appearance and the styling of the contents will change and we programmable by us through the definition of proper CSS rules. Hmm? So we'll see also how they work. So right now we, we reach a good complexity on the browser side. Hmm? The browser is becoming a very complex uh, um, tool, a very complex uh, object, uh, where that mes must deal on one end with the user, so it will, must provide all the user interface, the buttons, the menus, uh, the back and forward, the reload, and so on, uh, we, as part of the interface. Uh, and also it will include uh, the, um, the page. So there are actually two parts in the browser. One is the buttons, the, the interface of the application, and the other is the content of the page. You see, for example, we have some parts, the, the first lines here, all the tabs, uh, all the buttons, the menus, and so on, are part of the browser. But then a big part of the browser area is uh, occupied by, by the page. And uh, uh, the rules for uh, composing the page are programmable by the HTML and CSS combined uh, declarations. So this rendering engine has the goal of rendering the page on the user, while the user interface uh, has the goal of uh, uh, rendering the controls of the browser, for example, the first lines up there. Uh, the rendering engine, of, of course, can be programmed in, in JavaScript and is the one who is interfacing with the network component because it needs to retrieve the resources, the images, for example, that are needed for completing the page. And at the end, everything is composed into the user interface. So this uh, gray blocks UI backend uh, is the interface with the graphical libraries of the, uh, of the uh, operating system. So to draw a button, to draw an icon, to paint a text, uh, both the page rendering engine and the, int and the browser control engine must, of course, uh, uh, rely to the operating system down there. So this is the main high-level block structure of browser today and uh, if we focus on the rendering engine so we are not very interested on uh, on how the browser uh, defines their controls the rendering engine is a life cycle that uh, starts from the html from the html it builds the dom so it creates the object corresponding to the dom and there are a set of steps uh, that we see in a more detail in a moment uh, for going from the dom to the uh, render tree, so to the actual element that must be displayed and rendered on the interface. So for having a bit more detail, what we can see is that this is a, um, an, Im an image from the documentation of, uh, of Chromium, of Google Chrome. 
and uh, uh, it shows that the rendering process starts from two resources the html code and the style sheets the html is read parsed and transformed into a, a dom tree of elements the style sheets uh, more than once are parsed they are cascaded so they they, they are all the priorities uh, are resolved when there are more than one rule that applies to the same elements and so we have a set of rules to be applied these rules will be applied to the dom tree so we have a initial dom and then we have a, a modified dom where the style rules have been applied to the nodes of the previous dom and this modified uh, tree which is the rendering dom tree uh, now is interpreted by a layout algorithm that solves all the alignment issues the spy spacing and so on and finally will go to the display so the, to the painting process of the user interface this looks like a static process but in reality the javascript code may change the dom at any time through the api there and so every time we change the dom actually you can also change the style rules uh, every time we change the dom through the api all these processes need to be recomputed all these processes need to be redone so that the display will update immediately so these are the entry point where our javascript programs will change the dom and then the browser will immediately react and re-render everything and recompute the styles according to the modification of the dom um, so if we go uh, again <coughs> to a, a bit more of, uh, of, of detail we can see that the browser is made of different components and the different parts of the browser interface are uh, followed are uh, delivered by different processes there are actually different processes at the operating system level so there are some process that governs the browser so the initial part the lines there there are processes that render render the page and in some cases maybe the pages uh, contain plugins uh, and so these plugins are run in separate products uh, uh, in other processes um, which are different from the main rendering uh, one and all of them must go to the graphical user interface uh, sooner or later all put together all combined together if we want to follow the pipeline we have the first step in which the browser will read the html document when it receives the html document the browser needs uh, first to retrieve the network resources that are needed that's a link well so i mean i need to retrieve this css there's an image well i need to retrieve this image there's a script well i need to retrieve this script so when i read the html the browser will start many other uh, simultaneous network requests we already saw that at the beginning but in parallel the uh, the um, html code is being read analyzed and a tree of dom nodes is being created hmm? the tree of dom nodes so that we don't have to to handle with the, the text file anymore and this text file is being structured in a much more easy to use uh, data structure so no program no javascript program will ever read or see or modify the web page in the form of an html file uh, the, the normal form in which we int as a programmer interact with the uh, html page page is always as a dom tree hmm? okay so this is the first pass, uh, pa uh, the first step, just parsing. Once this is parsed, uh, in parallel, we should deliver, uh, we should uh, analyze the, the style sheets. So one or some of the resources here were style sheets. As soon as the style sheets are read, they are analyzed and they are applied to the uh, DOM node. So actually, the, the analysis of the style sheets decides for every node which are the rules uh, that apply for this node these rules apply for this node these rules apply and so on mm -hmm. so uh, we reverse the declaration of css in css we have a rule and we say which nodes uh, potentially are affected by this rule that is the definition of a css rule the browser just takes all the nodes and checks which rules apply to each of them taking into account that the same node may be selected uh, by many selectors and so it has to uh, solve all the cascading issues and the result here is uh, uh, attaching a computed style to every uh, every dom node mm -hmm. so the dom nodes are uh, initialized from the html 
but their properties are then changed by the application of the CSS styles. And these computed styles uh, at this moment uh, are, will be used uh, to make uh, layout decisions. So to understand uh, what uh, should go uh, left or right to what else uh, and what should go on top or on bottom or what, uh, what else, depending on all these computed properties. So only at this point, uh, the browser will be able to uh, analyze these uh, layout uh, uh, say decisions uh, and turn them into real graphical primitives that should be painted into the screen mm. so it's a very complex process uh, that uh, again is re-computed every time we change the DOM the computer style changes uh, and the layout uh, effect will also change we can also see some of the process in the in our um, inspector because if you go here you take you select uh, so in the in the inspector you can select any element i don't know for example this image here uh, you can see that there are some layout decisions here on the bottom right uh, that at the end decided the size the margin and so on and this nice uh, part is that uh, there's a computed part that will show us all the computed decisions so at the end by applying the css to the html taking into account the, the, the dimension of the images and so on, these are the results of the style computation. So these are the properties that have been applied to this node, to this DOM node, uh, according to the HTML definition, according to the CSS definitions. And from this computation, the layout engine decided this uh, uh, shape and this dimension and this position, uh, how to display uh, the element and so on. Hmm? So all of this uh, is transparent. With, here we have the node, the HTML. Here we have the style sheets that apply all the style sheets. We see that there are many properties and some of them are dashed, are barred, because uh, it turns out that these properties were uh, with the cascading overwritten by other properties that were more important. But all of these uh, style sheets were read and considered in the computation. The result of the computation is just the list of properties that really apply to this node and this node of course is uh, uh, then laid out uh, according to the result of this computation so it's quite a complex process and this process will have to uh, be updated every time a javascript code will change any property of any dom node so it's something that is running continuously and if you are more curious about this part <laughs> i can suggest you to spend uh, 10 minutes in having a look at this comic book uh, of some years ago but not many where in a comic uh, format uh, they are uh, telling the story of how uh, they were they made uh, the decisions on the chrome browser so this, this, these people that represent real engineers at, at google uh, each describe the design choices that they had to made uh, to make uh, to overcome many uh, problems uh, from the implementation point of view performance point of view security point of view usability point of view etc so it's a nice read it's just uh, 10 pages of, of comics uh, that we can read uh, and uh, so we can become more familiar with the problems that a browser is going to solve uh, every day but right now we still have one limitation so this is the last step we are going to to, to climb to climb to reach the top of the of our pyramid uh, with all this technology the browser right now has still one limitation and i pick this picture the limitation is that the javascript engine can only look at the current page through the dom this means that uh, every information that the javascript program can rely on is information that is already in the page it's have been must have been preloaded so actually uh, there's not possibility right now to update continuously the content of a web page so in social network we are used uh, that the content of the page is updating autom autonomously by itself and how can a web page show a content uh, that what that didn't exist uh, when the page was loaded the only possibility is that the javascript code should be able to speak with the server with the server not with the page after the page has been loaded so i load the page the javascript creates some dynamic behavior in the page but at the same time the, the javascript still keeps in touch with the server 
to get new information and so to update the page according to information that comes from the server and was not really embedded in the page at the beginning so what we see is that uh, uh, for creating this interactive website and this web application the client and the server should continue to be chatting without changing the page so without creating a new http request for a new html page the javascript should be able to talk to the server so from the picture i added two arrows these dash lines here where in a way we should provide to the javascript the possibility of uh, opening a call like uh, an http request of course to the web server to get some data so in at any time the javascript code can send a request to the server and the server will reply and these requests are dashed because they are asynchronous they don't break the page they don't interrupt the, the rendering of the browser they just uh, happen and the server will reply and at this point the javascript code here can at any time get new information and use this information in order to uh, display uh, or some modifications on the page hmm? uh, so we just need to allow one uh, possibility for the uh, javascript code to contact the server and in this picture i just added one line here uh, which is called ajax ajax stands for asynchronous javascript and xml even if xml is not really used um, which is a one api one library which is accessible to the javascript engine part of the standard library and this library is able to make calls to the web server the rest of the browser doesn't know it it doesn't need to change the page the javascript in the background contacts the server and they exchange information usually this kind of uh, asynchronous calls do not uh, generate html files uh, but they generate uh, raw data so the data the information that the javascript needs uh, to um, to update the page the content of the page and this data is usually encoded in form of javascript objects in a, in a format which is called json javascript object notation hmm? so these json files are generated by the application server the same application server which instead is not uh, no longer just generating html file but is also acting as an api server that generates some data whenever the front-end client needs those data and the data is then interpreted here by the javascript engine and then they will take their decision um, let's let me show you an example a very simple example uh, let's open uh, uh, google and we are very familiar with the fact that uh, when we type something in google for example web applications uh, we have uh, the auto completion of uh, of the possibilities hmm, the possible text uh, how how does it work well if we open the inspector now let's see open the network panel of the inspector and we can start writing something here so i start writing web application w e uh, oh, sorry. Let, let, let me reload the page sorry because i wanted to show you from the beginning okay we are loading the page the page is loaded let me delete it so that we have a, a come on a, a clean page and so i start to write web web space application and you see that every time i push a key some new request flashes down there what are these requests we i just wrote web apple and uh, uh, i have some suggestions here and have a look at the last request here it's a request of, of type xhr means xml http request is the type of asynchronous request that uh, will deliver a json file and if we have a look at the request let's make more space for it we saw that the request url is encoded like this make it let's make it larger uh, why i every time i push a key i type a letter with my keyboard uh, the javascript on the google website uh, will send a request to the server a, get, a normal get to the google web server 
uh, with uh, this URI, google.com slash complete, because it's trying to do the autocomplete, search query equal to web space APPL. So every time I, 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 I type a key, the content of the text box uh, is being sent to, to the server, to Google, and then Google will respond in this way. This is the response that uh, came out, uh, and which, uh, well, there is a syntax error because they, they did it on purpose, but uh, we, we, we can also understand what is happening here. It's sort of a, an array, web apple, some control character, ication, web application. And then we have web apple, ication, firewall. And uh, web application, Java, web app web apply uh, web application server web uh, application architecture and there are all the text uh, that is shown here hmm? so every time we type a letter uh, the javascript makes a request to the server the server replies with a data package with it's an array of values okay with, uh, with a structure and then the javascript will get this information and will paint this rectangle of possible completions every time I press a key. Hmm? So this is uh, also a very simple functionality which is based on the possibility from the JSON to in, um, intercept the user actions. Every user action I will uh, intercept that and then we make a remote call. I the server will query the database for the most likely completions in this case send me a data package with this information and I will use the information to update the DOM and create uh, all the auto-completion box. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, how our modern application work. And from the timeline, what we see is that uh, I compressed uh, on the left-hand side the T1 to T9 cycle on the server side. So this is, uh, imagine that as the first HTML call. And then once the page is loaded, before the next page, so T0 prime is not yet, while uh, n before the browser and the server were idle because the user was looking at the page and they had nothing to do, right now, every time the user does some action, I type a key, I move the mouse, I hover over a button or whatever, then uh, the browser tells that to the JavaScript runtime, well, the user will just uh, type the key, the user just clicked the button, the user has, has just moved the, uh, the mouse. So the runtime will need to query the web, web server, ask for some information that will be available later. And when this information will be available, so when the request will return, and we see that these requests are overlapping because they are asynchronous, maybe I am making more requests than the, the time that is needed to reply to one. So the the answers to this request will arrive out of order. So it's something that we need to take into account when we we'll program a web page. All the interaction between the client and the server is asynchronous because the reply will, will come much later and will come in another order different from what I have uh, requested. So that's the, com my, uh, the good part of the complexity of, uh, of client-side programming. And uh, so in continuously, the the JavaScript and the server are chatting over these uh, asynchronous calls. The, and also the, uh, the, the JavaScript and the browser are chatting over the DOM for the actions of the user and the modification of the DOM. And this happens continuously in the same web page without needing to reload a new web page. When I, when I move the web page, everything is destroyed and we create a new environment uh, from scratch. So these all the the work that JavaScript has, has to be uh, doing. And of course, the role of the web server has changed. Here, the role of the web server is to deliver an HTML file. Here, the role of the web server is just to deliver the bits of information that in this moment are needed by the client. And all of this uh, uh, relies on just one uh, specific JavaScript library, which is the uh, Ajax call. So there is one JavaScript object, HTML, HTTP request, uh, that handles all this asynchronous communication and of course we need to define some data formats for this to work but it's easy and more recently we are not using the html http request objects anymore 
uh, because in JavaScript there's a new interface, a new API, which is so called API, with a kind of object that are called promises that are um, used to manage uh, the asynchronous uh, happening of different events. So this will be uh, one important part of JavaScript that we need to learn in order to be able to, uh, to work in this environment. So these are actually the, the key knowledge and the complex knowledge, I would say, um, that we need to use uh, in order to, to manage this kind of asynchronous complexity. And so on the basis, and we are wrapping up the presentation, uh, on the basis of uh, the, the, all the technologies that we saw, today we are observing uh, some uh, trends. Hmm? The trends basically are that uh, um, there are many so-called single-page applications. So there are entire applications that are running on a single HTML page. So you connect to the website, it will, it will give you one HTML page, and from that moment on, all the control will be to JavaScript. JavaScript and the DOM, with libraries, with patterns, and so on. And this JavaScript will communicate uh, uh, with JSON over HTTP to the web server that will basically be an API server, will serve the data that we need. Hmm. So, uh, the programming of the application is no longer programming the web pages, the HTML pages, but more programming the JavaScript that, web, that will manage the front end and programming the back end API that will provide the services and the information that the front end needs. So uh, historically, we, see, we saw a shift from the early web applications where the browser was just managing the user interface we're requesting HTTP, returning HTML, and uh, the server, of course, hosted the data and the services of the logic, but also the user interface generation. The user interface is generated by the server in the early website. That all the information about the user interface is embedded into the HTML and CSS that is just displayed by the browser. Then uh, we moved into a, an intermediate model like uh, Google Autocomplete, where the server generates the html page for the google and then after the page is loaded there is an asynchronous engine for example that that uh, manages every key press as, as we saw so we have a still a page that has been generated by the server here but uh, uh, then the page is updated continuously uh, by um, by the javascript so the javascript may close the loop here so that it may respond immediately to the user actions and may or may close the loop there so it may update uh, the interface according to the, some new server information that comes uh, as uh, json data for example from uh, from the server and right now the modern way let's say of developing application and also is the one that we are using with react or with other web development um, frameworks uh, is that the role of the server becomes more and more just uh, serving data so implementing a, an api a program interface uh, and all the logic uh, will is being shifted uh, to the browser so the browser now will uh, uh, handle the user interface uh, but we also end the programming logic it will also end the, uh, um, the flow of the application and uh, uh, doesn't need uh, to receive uh, new html files uh, because uh, the HTML file is just at the beginning, it lost the JavaScript and everywhere it co is constructed by the JavaScript. Uh, one particular uh, example, uh, if you try to see, for example, the home page of Twitter, hmm. uh, it's very interesting because when you uh, go to twitter.com, the resulting web page is empty. So the body of the HTML doesn't contain anything, it's a blank page. Everything is being loaded and created by the front end engine here by, of course, querying the server for all the information that we need. Mm -hmm. So we are shifting from the server-side uh, generation of user interfaces to the client-side generation of user interfaces, and the role of the server is completely different. We don't need to manage the application anymore. Now we need to provide some services, APIs, uh, uh, for the uh, front-end to, uh, to work. And by the way, this also has some uh, good uh, um, consequences. Because uh, uh, we can e reuse the same server, so this is a different picture saying that uh, we have um, uh, the, a web server that provides some API and these APIs are just basically HTTP calls uh, where JSON data is exchanged. 
we'll come to discuss a bit about what this restful means but not for, it's not today basically we have http requests that exchange json data for for responsive web applications so it means that the same application can also be optimized for other interfaces so for example we have um, a applic web application that is want to, we want to run it on mobile devices uh, uh, so we can maybe have a completely different interface a completely different layout but we use the same data the same data the same services on the back end so we can optimize the front end also the presentation separate from the handling of the data and also we have a special case where uh, all the mo mobile native applications so an ios application and android application which are native code they are developed with using the libraries of the mobile, mobile operation system well they can also they will need also to interact with a server for exchanging the data and usually they do that using the same identical apis that the mobile applications are, are, are doing so today we are trying really to decouple all the apis and services and data access layers from the front ends uh, from the different uh, front ends and we can create many different front ends and uh, both mo uh, web and uh, mobile we can create different front ends using the same set uh, of backend apis that are becoming really two different uh, two different jobs there in this course uh, we will see the minimum necessary in order to be able to to bootstrap a, a very simple api server and by uh, the rest of the focus will be on how to exploit these apis for creating the application as a, as a last slide i want just to show you this table from wikipedia that just lists uh, the popularity of uh, the technologies that we mentioned today uh, we saw the most popular uh, websites from google facebook youtube yeah, amazon and so on yahoo and what's what languages and what technologies are they using uh, at the front end of course everything everybody is using javascript there is no other option it's the only language supported by all the browsers so every website must use javascript for their uh, front end uh, programming on the back end uh, there's a lot of difference a lot of variability uh, some of them are using php here and there some of them are using microsoft technology of course bing it is uh, msn microsoft.com uh some of them are using uh, um, python here and there usually mixed with other languages uh, uh, for example google is using a, a lot of languages including go which is their own languages that they defined uh, also in, on youtube so you see a lot of investment of a company on their technologies is being used on their website but uh, the, the server side technologies as you see are very complex uh, so different parts of the website run with different languages uh, uh, for providing different sets of functions um, and there's a lot of investment on this ecosystem from the servers uh, for the companies uh, for performance reasons ma uh, mainly or principles and uh, um, from the database layer so this uh, is sort of the application level uh, layer the web application I, I, the web uh, server I, I, we said is a standard component it doesn't need to be programmed on the application level uh, these are the many choices that you can find today uh, on mainstream websites on big mainstream websites so all of these languages are applicable let's say for the web development and from the uh, back end uh, you can see that all uh, practically all the websites uh, are using relational databases hmm? uh, some of them are starting to use also in addition to relational databases also some nosql database so uh, big table hbase uh, uh, and cassandra and basically those are the main um, nosql databases that have been used uh, uh, by these uh, uh, bigger uh, platforms or some in-memory database like redis which is a distributed uh, synchronization database uh, so something to complement the main uh, the main data is still in uh, uh, relational databases and some data the more dynamic one is also stored or is also handled by uh, lighter sources lighter forms uh, of, of non-relational uh, solutions there is some variability on the database level but not so much there's a lot of variability on the application level there is no variability at all for the front end of course uh, we should go into these front ends and see okay you are using javascript but 
what libraries and what frameworks are you using on the front end that would be the interesting question and to understand how to develop in javascript uh, in the different ways with different frameworks so i hope today we had a, a general uh, overview hmm, of uh, of the kind of components all the languages all the blocks all the servers all the clients that, the, that compose a modern web uh, application uh, this architecture is very complex it's, it grew over the years uh, with addition of different technology different language every time and so today we have to learn all of them in order to be you know, proficient in the development of, of these applications um, we have the general picture in the next lessons we will go in more detail on the single individual technologies that we that we need uh, for developing the application itself thank you